I'm Bill DeVille, it's United States of Americana on The Current, and it's so nice to be chatting here with J.D. McPherson. J.D., how are you? Bill DeVille, I am well, all things considering, I am very well. How are you doing? It's been a little while. We were trying to figure out when we saw each other last. And it might have been at, it was a Jonathan Kane studio in, in Nashville. Your memory the band, seems uh, during American American Fest. Fest. We'll go with that because your memory seems much clearer than mine. Yeah. And you were to have played, I know, in 2020, but uh, was that the one that COVID took away maybe last year? Yes. When uh, was the last time you were up, up north here in the Twin Cities? So it was two, two ago. Uh, again, the last year was like a big, is like a big black hole. It's like it's erased all my, like my kind of uh, landmarks for but I mean, I would assume we were trying when we were trying to play the Twin Cities every year. That was the goal was like we were always going to play the Twin Cities in December for the Sox tour. So that was the last one that we, we would have played at. Um, so that's 19, most likely, maybe 19, December of 19. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think so. Well, it's going to be a pleasure to, to have you back. The tour starts yeah. on December 8th and you'll be in the Twin Cities on Tuesday, December 14th, to play the Cedar Cultural Center. Well, what's it like to get back in this uh, holiday ho-ho-ho spirit? Are you there yet? Well, yes, um, I am. Uh, I start, like, literally the day after Thanksgiving. Actually, no, I start the day before Thanksgiving. That's when I get everything down. And then uh, I'm a fanatic, so, like, the morning after Thanksgiving, everything starts going up at my house. Vince Garaldi comes out. Um, and then I just start, you know, we've been planning doing this tour. Actually, this tour almost didn't happen. And, uh, you know, when I found out I could probably try to pull something off, um, you know, we don't play, we're not playing the usual rooms that we play in certain places, but I just wanted to do it so badly. Um, we were able to get something together. So um, I'm very excited to, to do it again. It's the first tour, my first tour in two years. So the last shows I played were two years ago in December. Well, and things are a little bit different this time. Besides the pandemic, you got, uh, besides Doug, who's the newest member of the J.D. McPherson band, everybody else is uh, doing different things now, huh? Yeah. So uh, that actually started probably February 2020. Uh, Jason called me after we had been doing some recording and he told me that he was going to be leaving. And, um, then it was Ray. And then most recently it was Jimmy. And, you know, I think in addition to people just wanting like things coming up, like, you know, especially with like Ray, he could, um, he was getting some offers to do stuff that was, you know, going to be really like hard for him to turn down well, Dan Arbeck and the Black Keys and stuff, yeah, right? Yeah, he's playing gigs with the Black Keys, and he's he's touring with Yola, which is, like, incredible for him. And um, so they also were able to get things happening on the road. Like, I didn't want to get right back on the road. I've been pretty careful. Um, I, you know, I just wanted to make sure that I was – I had a double dose and that everything was, you know, could be as safe as possible – before I got out. So, you know, it's just one of those things where people wanted to get back to work at different speeds or maybe wanted to try something different. And then also having a year off at home just changed everyone's idea of what they want out of a touring life. Yeah, I can imagine. Because you know, we hit it pretty hard when we were touring all the time and, you know, no days off, yada, 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 start to think. And I know Jimmy has been thinking a lot about he's had a growing family you know, he's got a little girl now and he wants to be at home as much as he can. So absolutely no love lost. I love those three, like, I mean, closer with them than certain family members I have. But so I understand it, but just chalk it up to, you know, this is what we're all kind of dealing with now. We're dealing with big change. And um, mm -hmm. luckily I have been able to secure some excellent players who I've actually worked with a lot in the past to come out um alex hall who played drums on my first record mixed my first second and fourth records um i mean he's just like a longtime collaborator he's like coming out playing the drums um so Northside gal is going to sound exactly like it did on the record <laughs> um, 
And then Bo Sample, who plays with Joel Patterson, and he used to play with Hot Club of Cowtown, uh, is playing bass. He's incredible. Um, and then my good friend Ben Streely, who plays keys with Nikki Lane, is is out with us. I've never played with him before, but he's just a good hang. So I I called him because I knew it would be fun. <laughs> and he's yeah. doing great. So we had rehearsal yesterday. It's been great. Well, I imagine you, you know, the old band had the songs down. You probably just had a couple rehearsals and you're ready for the road. But I imagine this time you had to go back and totally, you know, teach the the songs to, to all the new fellows, huh? Yeah, I will say, OK, so we played a couple of shows, like a couple of one offs that were cancels from last year. And Bo and Alex played. Um, we played as a quartet. We did it kind of under the radar. But um, so it was Doug and Bo and Alex and me. And that, so they learned the bulk of the regular set, but I will tell you, um, Bo and Alex sing together all the time. In fact, a little known, um, a little known bit of trivia. If you read liner notes on the Sox record, Alex and a lot of Chicago guys are actually singing all the background vocals on that. And Bo and Alex sing together all the time playing with, with Joel. So like we had a first rehearsal yesterday and it was just like, boom, they had all the, every thing right on point vocally all the music was a great i was like oh, you know it was like a huge sigh of relief and then doug is such a monster um he's been able to kind of help with the musical vocabulary stuff that i do not possess so here's a question for you what did you learn about yourself during during the pandemic um i learned that um I need to focus more on the moment for that sound sure. advice that changed. That really is the biggest change in myself over the last year is that uh, um, I needed to stop thinking about the future and worrying about things so much and just focus on what's happening. Um, family became, um, there were times where I'm, I'm, you know, it's something I learned, so I'm not ashamed to admit it, but there were times where work was, starting to take over family a bit in terms of my priority and my mental capacity. And so now that has shifted. I kind of know what's important now. Um, there's a thing where you're like, you know, if you're, if you're bringing home bacon, you, you, you tend to think about bacon all the time. Well, now I need to sure. think about home more. So um, that's a thing. And then with, you know, my cohorts moving on to other things um, it's, taught me that you know there is always a way to kind of springboard into something new and uh things can be an opportunity rather than um thinking of things as an opportunity rather than a, a detriment um also learned how to cook a lot better than i did learned how to garden learned how to raise chickens wow um, you got your own eggs huh i played video games for the first time in 10 years that was a big deal video games are great now I don't know if you've played video games in a while, but they're really good. I haven't, but I, that was my thing back in the you know latter part of the 70s. I spent a lot yeah. of time at the arcade, yeah. Well, with touring constantly, I never really played any, and uh, so I played a lot of video games. So you got some new hobbies during the pandemic, it sounds like, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually, at first, it was really bad really, really bad. It got really dark. And then it was like, I don't know, I see it as a, a blessing in a lot of ways. So, um, so you got, uh, some new things cooking in, in your musical world. I was watching, uh, CBS and Colbert and the CBS Saturday morning show and, and, uh, Robert Plant and Alison Krauss performed and, uh, look, lo and behold, there's JD McPherson playing with Plant and Krauss. How in the world did that happen? I don't really know, Bill. Uh, I was sitting <laughs> at home and I got a phone call from uh, a person who's uh, T-Bone Burnett's production manager. And I guess they were going to do a version of their first single, Can't Let Go, for the BBC. Mm -hmm. It was like the first kind of promo that they did. And I think the, I think the idea was they wanted to do kind of a more up-tempo um, version of the track so they were you know they wanted to record a new more up-tempo version of it i don't know really i know there was a list of guitar players i don't know who was on that list except for one person and i will not say who it was uh 
but I got a call to come in and play this one thing. And that was supposed to be it. And then, um, I got another call to come in and do the rest of the promo. And then it looks like I'll be doing the tour next year. You're Actually, doing the literally tour. just talked to Allison on the phone right before you, um, right before you zoomed in, but yeah, so be doing the tour with them next year. And it's like, you just never know where things are going to come from or, or, or how, but, uh, you know, things can turn around on a dime. So be ready is kind of my new motto. I imagine you, you what's, uh, what was Robert like to, to stand next to and play a guitar? Did it, does it bring out this Jimmy page in you a little bit? You want to shred? Well, it's a blast. Uh, well, I will say that like uh, the joke that I'm making is like my um, my symbol is so so instead of you know that's the joke is Jimmy Page's was so so mine is so so. Um, so, so. <laughs> he's really he's really funny, really witty, really smart, and like me, he was wants to talk about old records all day long, and that's I would say the short amount of time we spent together. That's most of the. Besides playing, that's pretty much what we talk about. You know, I'll be sitting down and he'll plop down next to me. He's like, JD, are you into Ral Donner? And I'm like, not really. And he's like, well, you've got to look past the cheese, mate. You've got to look past the cheese. And then it'll like dictate a list of singles, Ral Donner singles to listen to. <laughs> so I'll wow. put on my phone and, and uh, you know, uh, sometimes he'll like, I remember uh, we were doing um, the YouTube thing and, um, you know, he's like, JD, do you take requests? And then he'll like want to do like a Gene Vincent song, which I'm happy to oblige. Uh, so, you know, I think as much as anything, that's that's sort of like his primary, like me, that's his like kind of primary like passion in life is old records. But he's got a way more, um, he's just got a way better recall than I do. I mean, he remembers what label every track is on, the session players, where they, what city they record in. And he's like a I know he's got like eight or nine thousand forty fives alone. Oh my goodness! And he's just uh, insane musician um, and um, an encyclopedic knowledge of blues and rock and roll music. So it's really fun. <laughs> it's super fun. And I can uh, imagine. Yeah, I think that's kind of the. I think might be one of the reasons why I got called was because you know I think they just wanted to dip their toe into, you know some of the stuff that I'm known to do sometimes. Um, I know when they, when they wanted to do the can't let go thing, they was brought up the Johnny Burnett trio stuff was brought up, which, you know, is, I'm happy to do that anytime anybody wants to do it. And um, so maybe that's kind of why I ended up in that spot, but it has been a blast. The other, the rather, the musicians in the band, Jay Belarose, Dennis Crouch, Stuart Duncan, these are like, all incredible musicians. What's it like to stand next to, to those fellows and to play? I mean, well, is it intimidating. Um, they're incredibly welcoming. And yeah. we're really also, I mean, you know, it's just like anybody else. They all love music too. I mean, Dennis and I are both, we grew up here in similar plays. I'm from Oklahoma. He's from Arkansas. So immediately we sort of latched onto each other and he's super into Western swing music and I am too. And so we really bonded over that. And then Jay Belarus, who's one, he's maybe like, I mean, he's just one of my favorite drummers ever. It's like one of, there's a few drummers in the world where you can listen that are session players. You can listen. You're undoubtedly listening to that person uh, like Earl Palmer, you know, that you can always hear Earl Palmer, but Jay is just so singular in his playing. And so it's such a trip to play with him. But he's like really into jazz and he's really into um, we were watching this footage of uh, T-Bone Walker playing with like this all star jazz band and Lily Belson playing drums and um, uh, Dizzy Gillespie wow. playing with it. It was just, uh, you know, that's kind of I think the main bonding thing is like we all just love music and um, it's been amazing playing playing with them and. Allison, I just have to say, if we're talking about all these people, Allison is like a force of nature. She is like, uh, first of all, she's just on the ball with everything. I mean, she's like kind of running the show as far as like, she's just always got her eye on every little detail. And then she opens her mouth and like this supernatural sound comes out. 
And it just, you know, you don't need more than one take with uh, Miss Allison Krauss. She's unbelievable. Such an angelic voice. And I guess it was her idea to record that uh, Merle Haggard tune, too, Going Where the Lonely Go. Yeah. Oh, my God. I heard that on uh, at Blackbird when we were there for the um, BBC thing. They were playing a couple of the tracks for some label people that came by. And I got to sit in that room and listen to that on those giant speakers. And it was just like <laughs> weeping, you know, unbelievable. One of the, the coolest things about about uh, Robert and Allison's album is that all these old songs are being, you know, rediscovered, like uh, Randy Weeks uh, track Can't Let Go that Lucinda did and the mm -hmm. Merle Haggard tune. There's an Alan Toussaint song on there. Geishi yeah. Wiley. We'd love that. that Geishi track. Wiley one is a, it's a song that I've like, that's almost like I can't not play that song when I pick it up. So I've loved that song for years and years. It's such a haunting guitar part. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw that that was going to be on the record, I was like, oh, my God, you know, that's one of my favorite songs ever. And a very respectful and beautiful rendition of that tune. It's like almost uncoverable. You know what I mean? But they yeah. pull it off. It's it's really great. I heard the first time I heard that song it was David Johansson had a version of it with this uh, side blues project. that he I haven't on. heard that. Was that his uh, that wasn't his. um I know he did some old R and B stuff with his Buster Poindexter thing. Was it that, or was it something? No, else? no, it was under it was under his name, and a, I forgot Jansen. the name of the man. Just yeah, maybe three, four years ago, he did that. Yeah, what is it that? Good. Yeah, what is it that draws you to a, a good cover? I mean, this thing about uh, Allison and Robert—they just have this knack for finding these old songs. I know you have it too, but what is it that draws you to some of these old songs? Recording a cover is is a. Uh, Playing a cover live versus recording a cover, I think, are two very different things, because if you're going to record a cover or do a, a rendition of a cover, um, I guess, depending on the song, um, you have to be really careful that you don't try to, like, completely latch onto the thing that makes it, or, you know, you have to find a way to inject your own stuff into it. Um, that's, that's important. Uh, I've actually been, had some practice this lately. I've been working on a little project, um, doing a couple of covers and there's one or two tunes that I actually did that I've told my team I was doing. And I, I won't say which ones yet, but it was like, are you sure you're going to do that song? <laughs> because it's like, there's some things you just don't, you know, you just don't touch. But if you have something new to bring to it, I think it's fair game. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I believe it was you who recommended the Cactus Blossoms uh, record No More Crying the Blues. Wasn't that your idea when you produced that record for them? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, that song in the Sun catalog is like a real standout for me. You know, when pe most people think Sun, they think the stuff that's like the most lauded is Elvis, Jerry Lee, um, you know, Carl Perkins. Carl Perkins, sometimes Roy Orbison, but Roy Orbison was like <clears throat> really the best at his best um, when he when he split off to do his his thing that he's known for. But you know what I mean? There's all kinds of like gems on Sun, like the old blue stuff that's on there. But that Alton and Jimmy tune um, is so cool and weird. Like it's very uh, uh, haunting and it's got this weird descending chord minor chord line and um i don't know i just could hear those two doing that one and i honestly i think i i don't know I, I think they did as good a job as they could have done with it i just don't i don't see anybody doing it better than they did <laughs> right. no the brothers are back in business a new album due yeah in we just got a new single which is excellent as always yeah. It always works out. I love that line. It sure does. That's a very that's a very Jack and Page line. It always works. It kind of is. It kind of is. All right. Here's a question for you. I I'm just curious. Did, have you watched the Beatles get back? Yeah, you got about three hours to talk about it. This is like <laughs> all I've been talking about with anybody that'll talk about it. I'm just texting through my phone Rolodex. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Because I want to talk about it. Your um, thoughts as a musician in the, you know, got to well, yeah, I feel like it know? should be shown to, you know, if any, if any kid decides that, you know, 
they want a, a guitar or a bass or a drum kit for Christmas, they should also receive that before they even get started because it will show you everything you need to know about playing music with other people. There's going to be uh, ups and downs. It's like the elevator business. Uh, you're going to get, you know, you get to see that having genius um, isn't going to happen without drudgery coming along with it. Like you're going to have hours and hours and hours and hours of hard work before you're, genius becomes apparent that probably the biggest thing I learned from the Beatles thing was um, the, the iconic songs that we all know um, they sound pretty crappy at the beginning. Like, <laughs> you know, they just got some rudimentary chords. They're just kind of talking over it. You got some, you know, you got George in the back kind of noodling over, over the top of it. Ringo's just doing twos and fours. He'll give you a backbeat. And it's not until, you know, they run it through the machine, you know, that you actually get the thing that we all love, you know, that the magic. So uh, that's that's a thing I actually learned a lot from that is like there's been ideas that I'd have that I just move on quickly because it doesn't come together quickly. And sometimes you just have to, you know, what is George talking about? I remember what song it was. It was probably something or whatever. He's like, yeah, I've been working on this for like six months or something. It's like, of course he was you know, but, um, the, the inner interpersonal dynamics of that band, the internal politics, not only within the band, but outside of the band, they lost their manager. You can kind of see some vultures in the movie kind of circling around. There's some business people and some publishing people coming in and starting to circle. And, uh, you know, they're looking for leadership. Paul is stepping into that role. And I think he really enjoys being in that role. And um, it's just, you can just see all the stuff happening in real time. It's wild, man. I mean, it is wild. One thing that. I was really happy about is that, uh, you know, early on, I was worried that there wasn't going to be any joy in the thing at all. Yeah. And well, you don't get, get that in watching uh, Let It Be you don't get that impression. It's a, it's a breakup movie, you know, until you see this and then you see like, they're still having fun and they're still, they still love each other and they're goofing around and John's one way, one day, and he's another way, another day. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it was, there's moments of triumph in that too. It was really great to see it, man. It, it sure was. You know, it's like they pulled up the curtain and you see, you know, how the sausage was made. And I never yeah. thought I'd ever see something like that, which is, you know, to me, pretty thrilling. Until you see like the Apple box truck back in and they un they're unloading a gear like that they just summoned. Aside from all that, where the Beatles can have all these resources that they have, most of the time you're looking at what looks like a bunch of kids in a garage. You know, I mean, yeah, they've got the newest, latest fender roads and they've got all new fender gear and they're but i mean for the most part that looks like what every band looks like when they're in a rehearsal space or in a garage it's it's incredible man it's I a gift so too well it's so so nice to to chat with you jd mcpherson and good to see you and i'm very excited about catching your show next tuesday it's the socks rock and roll christmas tour with Joel Patterson, and that's happening at the Cedar Cultural Center. Do you have a new album in the works? There's a couple. Things in the, there's a couple things in the works. Um, some of which you'll be hearing very shortly, and then I would imagine the rest of we will be hearing probably after the Allison and Robert stuff is wrapping up. But um, planning to head into the studio. I've been in the studio uh, the last this last part of this year. And uh, then planning on going back in um, early next year. So should be seeing some stuff pretty soon. I'm and feel, you should, yeah. feel invigorated. I feel like I've, I've got all these new ideas all of a sudden and just feeling really excited about playing music again. It's been a while. Mentioned to Robert and Allison that they should, uh, you know, make sure they uh, book a, a Twin Cities date. Could you do that for us? I'll, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I, I generally still just kind of stand in the corner uh, with my volume knob turned down until I need to do something. I don't, you know, yeah. just 
I'm just I'm just here to play guitar. <laughs> it must be kind of fun to be a you know a side man. You, instead, of, you don't have to call the shots. You the just best. learn the music and play. Yeah, <laughs> best. I don't have to. I yeah. It's um, it is the best. I I've never really done that before, and uh, to do it at this level is is mind blowing, man. But yeah, it's super fun. Super fun. All right. It's United States of Americana. It's J.D. McPherson, and we'll see you next Tuesday. And uh, it's a pleasure chatting with you. Good to Take see care, you. Bill. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.